Hi, this is Charlie Montatiello with Blue Bear Flutes. Of course, you can find us at bluebearflutes.com. You can find us under Blue Bear Flutes and Blue Bear Arts on Facebook, Instagram, a few old tweets in there somewhere, I'm sure, and just about anything else on the web. Anyway, the reason we're here today is to show you a little kind of a trick, insider trick of the trade, uh, something that many of us know about when it comes to making Native American flutes, and many of you have had questions about this kind of thing. It is what to do when your material that you're going to make your flute out of is smaller than the pattern that you have to make your flute with. So just to kind of show you and maybe give you an inside idea on how to do things a little differently than what you might think, I'm going to take a piece of material that's smaller than the size I need to make a certain type of flute and I'm going to make a slightly different type of flute out of it. Um, as complex as that might sound, it is something that is, you know, a serious issue when you're working on Native American flutes. Now, having said this, uh, what I'm going to be using is, of course, one of the patterns out of our book, The Art of Native American Flute Making, and uh, there are just countless schematics in the back for making just about every kind of flute that we make today, uh, plus uh, schematics on making a, like a walking stick flute, uh, even making one out of PVC if you like, and eagle whistles that we uh, we offer for selling on our website alike. Some of that stuff uh, is you know pretty valuable information in here in our book. Also, the measurements are in standard and metric for those of you that you know want to have the convenience of having both at your fingertips. Uh, you guys know me in the shop in here. I usually use uh, just about everything, so my most of my rulers are standard and metric, unless they're just really cheap and I needed a cheap ruler. Uh, having said that, uh, let's see, I'm going to try to follow that pattern and give you guys measurements in standard and metric. If you know me, like I was beginning to say, um, I actually use standard measurements for certain sizes and me uh, metric measurements for different sizes. It's much more convenient for me that way. Most everything here in the United States is measured by inches. Uh, we're still under the old uh, you know, English system, and uh, the metric system is convenient so many so many ways, uh, especially when it comes to millimeters, which is what I use it for. So, having said that, let's go ahead and begin. What I have done is I've grabbed a piece of river cane. Now, of course, your material could be just about anything. You could have a cardboard wrapping paper tube. I don't know if any of you have seen that video, but it's worth looking up. Go back to our Blue Bear Flutes uh, YouTube channel by clicking on the little link to our Blue Bear Flutes there, and go back to uh, Christmas a few years back and you'll see a video on me making a flute out of a cardboard uh, Christmas wrapping paper tube and it plays great. It's a really beautiful sounding flute and that's just an idea. You can use any kind of material to make flutes with. Anything that's hollow uh, and round already makes it even easier. You don't have to use hollow or round as you'll see in some of our upcoming videos. However, having something like that already does help out a lot. So. For me, it's going to be a piece of river cane. For you, it could be anything from uh, some hopefully safe weed growing in your backyard, not some poisonous ones because there's a lot of those. you got to look that up. Uh, or maybe a hollow uh, piece of wood that you found somewhere that's already hollow or cardboard. So uh, this right here is going to be my material for use, and I've already measured it. I really wanted to make an E flute, but this piece here, I measured it to see if it was long enough. It's about 16 inches long, if you'll notice, and when I say long, I mean from the edge of the partition here down to the bottom of the flute, and I needed something that was 17 inches long. So really, this would probably make a, like a, a sharp E, but, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, this is recorded live. <laughs> anyway, I would uh, want to make a sharp E, but um bum anyway. Um, I would want to make a sharpie, but I'm thinking about making something a little bit sharper than that just to get it kind of in tune and make it a little bit better sounding because nobody really plays a sharp E flute. Anyway, uh, might be a good video one day, you know what I'm saying? But uh, So I'm going to use the pattern for our E flute, and if you want to take a look in here, I've marked our page. I think I can show you right over here, right down. So here is the E flute. This is the standard side. Of course, you can look over here and see uh, more of the metricish uh, for other things. Anyway, we're focused on this. The E flute needs a 7 8 inch bore and roughly quarter inch holes. At least that's where you want to start off at. 
quarter inch is going to be this roughly size of the sound hole as well as the size of each of the fingerings and then of course you'll need to attune accordingly but uh, from the edge of the sound hole here to the first fingering is going to be for the E flute six and a quarter inches then for the next fingering is seven and an eighth inch uh, then we have eight and seven eighths ten and an eighth and eleven and an eighth for the last fingering and then roughly seventeen inches long which of course we already know we can't make this flute seventeen inches long there's a few different directions we could go with this but I'm going to show you the one that uh, that follows this particular mindset of course those of you who have watched other videos that we've made in the past it is possible to take a pattern for this E flute and make it 16 inches long and put a plug in the end of it. Uh, if you restrict the size of the inside diameter of the flute uh, so that it's smaller, it will actually cause the tone to go lower. And in that particular way, all you would have to do is use the same exact fingerings where they're at, put a plug in the bottom of it as long as it's not much smaller than, say, uh, two inches shorter than the pattern, usually you can make this happen. Uh, that doesn't make the most perfect sounding flute it, to my ears, however, it does make a good sounding flute and you could, you could go that direction. That, once again, is something we've done in the previous video. This is going to be something where I'm going to show you basically how to figure out your own pattern. And that is, like I said, valuable information when you're making a lot of flutes. Or if you're making flutes out of natural materials or maybe even a branch flute if you're trying to make one of those and it's a little shorter but you really like the piece of wood and you want to use it to make something close to this range but you don't have an exact pattern to follow. Okay, so just to show you what we're going to do, I'll go ahead and mark these um, fingering placements on this wooden ruler. I like to say very handy to have these wooden rulers. They're semi-disposable, can be used for a number of things other than a ruler. Let's start off at the first fingering is six and a quarter, which is super easy to figure out. A quarter is right there. And then we got seven and an eighth, which is right there. Once again, these fingerings are thereabouts. And then we have eight and seven eighths, which is from over here, right about there. Okay. Then we go down a little further to ten and an eighth, which is right about here. And then we got eleven and an eighth, which is right about there. Okay, so what I've done is I've marked the placement of the fingerings for our E flute. Of course, many of you realize you can make an F sharp out of this and you can just follow the pattern, but um, F-sharps don't always come out precisely unless you use the exact same size inner diameter. And if your material is a little larger, a little smaller, you know, there's, there's a reason why you want to do this. So let's set this book down for just a second. And now with my marked fingerings here for an E flute, we're going to call this a quotation mark E because it's not going to be an E because it's simply too short. And I'm going to pick the best side of my river cane. I know you all have seen me make cane flutes before. I'm going to hold that right there. I guess I could hold it on this other side. It might line those holes up a little bit better. Yep. Okay. And what I could do is mark it exactly as it is and then make these holes just, it's going to wind up making them huge because um, we're using a piece of material here, the river cane, being shorter than the, the 17 inches that we usually say to make an E flute with. Um, it's going to make these holes actually quite large to be able to get them in tune. So this is what we're going to do. Some of my friends, other flute makers that I've known for a while, use a rubber band technique. The reason I don't use that rubber band technique is it's not as accurate as my precise measurements here. So I like to kind of take a little of the guesswork. Can't take all the guesswork out, but you can take a little of it out, which really helps. What we're going to do is we're going to take this pattern and slide it upward just like that. And if you notice, right here, uh, up at the, the partition inside of the river cane, for those of you watching that have never seen my videos on river cane flute making, there is a natural link in here where this outer link is, which is the partition of the flute. You'll get to see some more of it while we're working on this flute. But I slid it up about 7 eighths of an inch, somewhere between 7 eighths 
and almost an inch, which is the inside diameter of the flute lengthwise. So this is how long, it, how big it is in diameter inside, and I made it that way long and just shortened it up that much. And having done that, I'm going to go ahead and mark my holes where they're at, and we'll see if we can't work some magic on this guy here with tuning. And now, if you look at it, I'll show you how this guy here looks, you, uh, you can see that the space up here is now shorter than the space down here. And in most cases, that's what it takes to make a, a good sounding flute. Um, you know, in this particular type, you want the distance between the sound hole up here or the partition um, and the first fingering to be a shorter distance than the distance down here. Usually, that's if it's a mid-range flute. So there's so many if, ands, or buts. However, like I say, this will at least give you kind of a head start on figuring out how to come up with your own flute patterns. If you need something that's, say, for example, in the key of E flat, what would you do? Well, if this was at least 18 or 19 inches long, all you would do is take that same E pattern that I just marked on this ruler, and you would slide it down the length of the inside diameter's width of the flute. So if the inside diameter is 7 eighths of an inch in diameter, you would slide it down 7 eighths of an inch, and that's going to give you roughly an E-flat, supposing the length of your flute will support it. I say 18, 19 inches to be on the safe side, then you can cut it off to an E-flat, then your fingerings will be perfectly where they belong. In this case, we've already got a piece of material that's 16 inches long from the pattern, uh, normal pattern uh, partition area <laughs> down to the bottom, and because it's too short, I slid it upward because we're going to make a virtually traditionally tuned flute. It's going to be close to an F sharp, I'm imagining. Um, and we're going to do that with this E flute pattern. So this works with all different flute patterns. You know, if you need to make one um, that is going to be lower, for example, a lot of you have seen my video on making a low bass A flute. And uh, the one thing that I'll tell you about that uh, with making the larger diameter lower tone flutes is once you get past say a low D flute you can actually use the D flute pattern that's in my book to make a low C, a low B, a low A so long as you know one little trick and that is um, so you have your fingerings you want to once again stretch it down the length of the inside diameter per half step that you want to lower the flute um, keeping in mind that when flutes get to a certain bore, say for example inch or inch and an eighth, inch and a quarter, um, that will only support a certain tone flute. You need really about a, almost a two inch bore to make a low bass A flute. Um, but you can slide the pattern down and mark your holes um, using, using the same technique like I mentioned that you know you basically measure the inside diameter and length and that's a half step and another half step makes a whole step and another half step and so on and so on and so on. Like I said, you have to experiment with this to really get, get the hang of it. But the one key factor in making the low ones is that you will have the fingerings here and then after you mark those you'll move down about a half of the inside diameter and then mark your bottom fingerings. Those of you who are really interested in making Native American flutes, this piece of information is, is, like I said, invaluable because myself, that's how I came up with all of my flute fingerings. It's allowed me to make uh, low D flutes nowadays with 5 16 diameter holes. And uh, for people that have smaller hands, being able to play a flute with smaller fingerings that are close enough together that their fingers will match uh, the holes without stretching out really, really out of place. Um, and being able to cover the holes with your fingerings, uh, your fingers, if they're smaller than, you know, say a medium-sized hand, that's, that's invaluable information. So, once again, little info, like I say, something I just wanted to help you out with. I know a lot of you probably rewind that last part a little bit, but basically when you, when you have a larger length flute, the distance between these top two holes and the bottom three holes are usually um, about a half of diameter um, longer per, you know, I guess about a whole step of flute.
So anyway, that part gets kind of confusing, and, and uh, some of you who are into making low flutes, you probably know what I'm talking about. Let's go over and drill this so I can stop talking for a minute and see if we can't get it. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and drill out the area for the sound hole and then the fingerings, and then we'll, uh, we'll auger this down and kind of go make it play. That is a 3 16 drill bit that I use. Um, you could use a quarter inch drill bit, but I like to use a 3 16 because with our burning tool technique that we use to make our flutes, it gives us a little bit more room to uh, make a mistake, I guess I could say. <laughs> gives you a little more margin of error, which is nice. This Forstner bit is a one and a half inch diameter Forstner bit. And it's the one I use on just about all of our flutes from a high D to a low A. Uh, we use the same Forstner bit. I will warn you, number one, make sure that you're wearing your goggles uh, on your eyes, not on your head like you see me wearing them a lot. But make sure you have your goggles. If you're doing anything like this, make sure that you're qualified to be doing something like this. You know, And certainly if you're not, make sure that you have help doing it because this isn't the easiest thing in the world. As a matter of fact... Drilling into something that is already round without a block to stop it uh, is very difficult and very dangerous. A lot of people create a little block stop that you can set your round item down into. I've been doing it this way for probably 35 or so years, uh, drilling into round materials with uh, drill bits, so I'm kind of used to it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to line the edge of this Forstner bit up with the back edge of this hole and that will give me a nice flat surface that we can put our our block on top of and put our track into to make it play so if you'll watch this is actually the trickiest part of of this process and uh, it's one where we have to be careful not to go too deep because it'll tear the river cane up Not too bad. So the next step is actually going to be to flatten this down. I know many of you have seen videos where we've done this, but I thought, hey, let's put it in this video so you guys can see what's happening. It's not just kind of magic and poof, all of a sudden it's happened. Um, we augered it down. I did go ahead and sand this area with a little bit of a kind of a slope on it there, as you see. It helps the air to go across the sound hole better once we make it. And I went ahead and sounded my mouthpiece so that it was nice and smooth and cleaned it up a little bit with some steel wool, which I'll do better in just a moment. See how nice that, that looks after you've done that? Uh, just basically taking the, the debris off the outside of the river cane because whether it's from being handled or the muddy swamp that I pulled out of, uh, it's got something on it. So, uh, first we will use this tool here. I'm testing to make sure it's not too hot to hold. And then just basically flatten them down. This step, of course, is not one that you absolutely have to do, but for us in the shop, it's an extra step we like to take to make sure we create a wonderful sounding flute. And if you're wondering what I just did, I threw that <laughs> burning tool on my bucket of water over here. you got to know about some of these things. Okay. We've got a little flame happening over here, so let's see if we can put that out with a piece of steel wool without catching a steel wool fire. That doesn't work piece of fabric always works. Just trying to smother that ember. There we go. Which looks like I might need to carefully nip some of this in the bud. This is super glue that I'm using to make sure that the area of my track here is nice and solid in my area where the block is going to sit. Sometimes when it embers up like that and starts burning, it's, it's a sign that it's a little thin. So we'll be careful from this point forward. Here's one of my track tools. Do not want to breathe super glue fumes. No. I don't want to breathe them. I know that. Okay, that one will have to wait till it heats up again. 
this is starting to ember up here too. So I'm going to grab a file, see if I can't put some of that fire out. There we go. So we need debris off of this thing. There we go. That's better. While we're waiting for this rod here to heat up to burn the track in it, I'm going to use this other rod to just make some starter holes, which will be, you know, the ones that I drilled here. We're going to burn them out to about a quarter of an inch as per my book schematics. This is a 5 16 burning rod. It is tapered such that though it starts at the beginning of about 3 16 goes to a quarter pretty abruptly and then most importantly has sizes between a quarter and 5 16 which is kind of typical. Most fingerings are between a quarter and 5 16 So in the meantime this guy here is glowing red. I know I've said it before, though I can't say it enough. There are so many other ways you can make the track of a flute. You don't have to use fire. This is the way we choose to do it. We've been doing it this way for a long time. And uh, for us, it's just kind of commonplace. It's something we do every day. We make sure that it turns out a certain way. We use certain tools. You don't have to, though. Like I say, tracks can be made with knives. Um, there's most of the big industry type people use a milling machine or even a router to do everything in this area. I did that, I guess, I don't know, shoot, it's been 20 years ago we used to do it that way. and I decided this here is much better. It's accurate for us, for one thing. It is very quick. Um, it cleans as it burns. I mean, there's so many reasons why this is a good way to do it for us. really helps to have a nice, sharp, I want to say sharp, very cleaned off um, track tool with the sharp edges of it so that they make a perfect straight line and perfect groove in there. So you can kind of see, I'll come back with my file and clean it up a little bit. That's not bad. These days, my wife Jessie usually makes the river cane flutes, and I'm usually busy making other types of flutes. One trick that she does that I'll, I'll mention to you, because it's a very good, good technique in my opinion, she will go in and fill uh, with sawdust and super glue the uh, area underneath of the track here, and I'll show you where. Here's my file and it can go down quite a ways further. It's at least another quarter, almost a half an inch from the edge of this track area right here down to the inside partition. The partition's only about as thin as this little file. Um, it's enough to stop it and make a flute, but uh, when you start burning into the area right here to build a track out of, with river cane and some other materials like elderberry and, and uh, of course our sawgrass that we use quite a bit, bamboo, um, materials like pokeberry. I've been working on a pokeberry flute for a while. Pokeberry is a poisonous plant, by the way, so if you don't know what you're doing, stay away from it. Um, but uh, she'll build that up in there, and that'll give you a nice, solid track. Instead of worrying about it burning out like, you know, so many of us do, uh, that will actually help combat those kind of problems. It's a good technique that she came up with. I'm going to do it this way to be quick, and maybe in a future video I'll show you more about that the technique. There we go. Not this too wide. So what I'm going to do too is grab one of my track tools here. I'm going to clean this up just a little bit. It's this hobby knife right here we use on some of the tracks to clean this wall up. Like that. You basically want to be sure that your sound hole width is the same as your track width. It's better to have a slightly wider track than a narrower track, one that's narrower than the size of your sound hole. It's probably best to have them as close to perfect as 
as possible, having them about the same width. But if one has to be bigger than the other, it's better to make the track just a little bit wider in the sound hole. From the fire and from the heat, I have a small crack. I don't know if you can see it forming right there. What I'm going to do, as with any woodworking project, use just a drop of good old super glue, and that's going to stop it in its place so that it doesn't travel on. You should never touch this stuff with your skin. <laughs> Never do that. It was a bad idea. And just as a last little precaution, I'm going to go ahead and clean these walls up with my fire. Just like that. And get a little fire starting to burn off too much in there. But I think we've got to the end of that. Where we no longer need to burn track here. I think we're good there. You can, of course, clean it up a little bit more with a file. Honestly, the file itself is not what I'm using so much as I'm using the edge of the file. The edge of the file is not really a file, it's just like a little flat edge. You could use a just a really sharp little piece of metal to do this. We used to use a uh, X-Acto knife to do this, or a hobby knife. Not naming any names here. <laughs> we used to do that, and then uh, a friend of mine turned me on to using um, a chisel, and a chisel works great too, and you can sharpen a chisel as well. Let's see, I'm going to take this tool off. And then put my bear tool up here because I have a feeling I'm going to want to put this bear on this. And let's see where we're at here. I could go ahead and put my block on. It might be just a pinch too long. Let me go sand that off real quick. I'll be right back. So I cut my block out of a piece of river cane. As you can see, it's just a sliver off the side of it. And I've got it so that it's about the edge of the back edge of the sound hole is where it stops so I've made it a little bit slanted right there and just kind of rounded it off some to make sure that it plays properly. I'm going to use a squeezy clamp to hold this thing in place while I test it and then we'll put it down more permanently. Let's see what key that's in. It's almost a perfect F. I may even tune this thing to F just to, to get it uh, close, but for right now, let's do it traditionally tuned so I can hear what it's going to sound like. And of course, if you decide you do want to tune it to F, I think you can find this chart on our webpage or you can uh, go to our info page down at the bottom. There's a list of all the minor pentatonic scales. And just use the F. F is not a uh, scale that I make a whole lot of. I think I've made one F flute in the last year. make a lot of F sharps. make thousands of those. But, but maybe one F flute upon request from a customer. Um, and uh, it's just not a real common minor scale. However, it does sound good. I will admit that it sounds good. And that note's almost a G, which is supposed to be a G sharp for an F scale. But like I said, we're trying to tune this by ear. Sounds pretty good. Just a little bit flat. I'm blowing at different levels, different speeds to see if I can make it go in tune or if it's maybe a little bit too sharp already. But it sounds like that note's flat. So let's make that go just a little bit sharp. And when I say make it go sharp, I'm actually using this graduated burning tool to enlarge the size of this hole. I'm making a little 3 16 hole uh, that I burned to a quarter of an inch, a little bit closer to 5 16 Let's see what it sounds like. Much better. It kind of fluctuates between flat and sharp there. It's not bad. Of course, that note is incredibly flat. If I was making a F flute going by this right here, the second from the last note would be a C. So, and uh, that one kind of makes my ears hurt. <laughs> so, uh, let's put it a little bit closer in tune.
The next note, of course, here, the second to last finger is actually D sharp. The third note that I was talking about was the C, which is still a little bit flat as we speak. This D sharp is just crazy flat still. That's really close, but not exactly where I want it. So I'm going to make it just a little bit bigger. One thing I will warn you, prying a tool inside of a piece of river cane, whether the tool is hot or not, is a bad idea. Um, a lot of times if you pry inside of this round material, it's got a lot of tension on it, and you just go and pop right open. So don't do that. I'm doing it very gently. And sounds good up until this uh, extra F here that is a little bit on the flat side, so I'm going to burn the hole out larger. Larger hole brings it closer to in tune. That's really, really close. Just being extremely gentle with that burning rod in there. So the bottom note is still a little flat. The other guys are really close to in tune. I'm going to leave this tool uh, hot because I may need to come back and tune it in just a second a little bit more. And I'm about to burn my bear on it, and then I'll finish it up and show you what it looks like when it's finished. But for right now, the bottom of the sky being so flat, it's only 10 cents, but to me that's like night and day. I'm not going to take my tuner over to the sander. I'm just going to take this with me. I'm going to shorten it probably about a quarter of an inch, and uh, that should bring it perfectly in tune with the rest of the flute. Then we'll clean it up, oil and wax it, tie the block down with a piece of leather, and I think we'll have a wonderful flute here. So give me just a second. I'll be right back. you guys know that I was doing this by ear, I leave my tuner over here while we recorded it. So at the last moment we said, wait a minute, let's do that and turn the video back on and, and uh, here we are. Anyway, so all the notes are good. I'm going to turn this burning tool off. And for the time being, Take this block off so that I can clean it a little bit up here around the edge. Let's see, just like that. There we go. And let me clean the rest of the flute while I'm at it. Truthfully, you could probably keep buffing this thing with a piece of fine steel wool and come out with a really shiny instrument. I like just cleaning it off a little bit. I'll come back with my oil and wax and get that down to where I need it. I think that's not bad. A little bit of debris in here. I probably should blow out with my air compressor. Let's see. Put a little bear stamp on here. There we go. Turn that off. See how it puts that uh, oil from the river cane there all over the place and, and it burns it as well. So I'm just going to wipe that off like this. Look what a neat design. That's really pretty. So from here, really simple stuff. Oil and just drip the oil in there as I turn it around. Circles a little bit, a little bit extra. Let's see where we're at. One inside. I did clean the inside of this out a little bit with my burning rod or with my uh, cleaning rod a little bit ago. So it should be a little bit better there. 
I like to tilt it back until I can see the oil run out the track here just a little bit. It usually tells me that I've done it enough. Not quite enough oil in there yet. This takes quite a bit of oil. Is that my kitty? Hey, Ronald. Come here, kitty, kitty. Well, Ronald came up here to inspect the shop. What are you doing, kitty? How's everything looking here today, bud? Looks like a mess, doesn't it? Hey, kitty, kitty. Come here, bud. You want to come sit over here and watch me make a flute? Maybe. Let's see. Ronald's about a friendly little kitty, isn't he? Next, we'll take some of our bear fat here that we make in our crock pot. We always have that guy going, and I'm going to wipe the outside of this flute, and then I'll wipe it with my cleaning rag, tie the block down, and we'll be good to go. One thing you like to do when you uh, use the wax method that we do, rather than lacquering your flute, is make sure all the pores are clogged up with that stuff. That really helps to protect it, make it last for, for a long time. People a long time ago knew these tricks, and today we try to follow as many of those as we can. Anywhere there's an open pore, it's a good idea to put some, some wax to seal it up with. I think this cleaning cloth here is just about had it. Hey, Ron. Let's see what's going on, buddy. You're just a big old kitty cat, aren't you? You're going to get dirty in this sawdusty shop. So, let's see where we're at. I'm going to grab some leather here, and we're just about finished with this flute. I did promise myself one day I would teach y'all how to use this. I'm going to have a separate video for it. This is a little plastic leather lace cutting tool. We make all of our lace here in the shop. We take a piece of leather like this and uh, basically using the lace cutter, this technique is one that I've been doing all of my life. I make it look a lot easier than I'm, I'm told that it really is. Because this lace cutter here does take a little bit of practice. In, uh, Learning how to do that. Hey, Ron. So, I promise there will be an upcoming video on how to make leather lace with one of those, and I'll tell you where you can get them at. I think I'm pretty pleased with this little guy. Got some oil dripping down there, huh, Ron? Go ahead and tie my bow back here. We've gotten to where we almost always, if we can help it, tie one of these little bows on the back of our flute. It helps to keep it together. What you doing, buddy? <laughs> Just reach for this guy, huh? Anyway, so there is our flute. Let's see if I've got too much oil in the track area. So that's a good... You like the way that sounds, buddy? That's a good F flute right there, tuned by ear, um, and uh, you see what you can do when you have a pattern that is larger than the size material that you have to make the flute out of, you actually get something really great out of it, something that uh, you may have been looking for, for example, if you were looking for an F flute, there's one way you can make one, another way would be to take the F sharp pattern and move it down one inside diameter length of the flute. So. 
Uh, that, I think, is a, is a good technique there for you. Like I say, once again, this is a little bit more of an advanced Native American flute making or any kind of flute making technique that many of you have asked about. What do you do when you want to make a flute in a slightly different key? Uh, or if you want to make it flat or if you want to make it 432 or 528 or just traditional 440. Um, and I say traditional, but it's just like an American tradition, I guess, of tuning instruments to 440. Um, so this is what you do. You basically move it up if you want it to be sharper, move it down if you want it to be more flat, um, and then kind of work with what you've got there accordingly. So anyway, once again, this is Charlie Monto Tiello with Blue Bear Flutes. I hope this video has found you all very well. We do appreciate you watching our videos. Be sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We do appreciate that as well. And we like to show you new and different techniques when it comes to making musical instruments, mostly Native American flutes, uh, although we've, I think, made quite a few others at this point as well. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed this. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, always please leave the positive ones uh, on our video here. If you have more in-depth questions, please feel free to send me an email. I will get to them as quickly as possible. Shoot me a message on Facebook is a good way as well. But it's always better if you're friends of ours on Facebook. That way, that message goes through to our regular <laughs> folder. Gosh, there's so many things about technology these days, right? Uh, but anyway, the best way to contact us is probably through our website if you have uh, a more in-depth question on making a Native American flute. So you guys take care. Thank you so very much again for watching. And it uh, looks like we have Ronald's approval here. Thanks, buddy. And happy flute making, happy flute playing. Y'all take care.